My name's Andrew Pryfogel. Um, I'm married to a beautiful woman, Susie Pryfogel. Um, 18 year old daughter named Hannah goes to school at Valley Christian up on the hill. I'm really glad to be here to be able to do this. Um, this, is, this is hard to do, so bear with me. But it's really important to do. It's, it's really important. That, uh, I'm showing that picture for you guys. Uh, I told them last night that I met my wife in eighth grade. That's, my, uh, that's a picture of the two of us in eighth grade. She's sitting down and I'm standing up because if she stood up, she'd be taller than me. All, all five foot four of her. <laughs> She was very close to my family all the way through high school, and this whole story has a direct impact on her as well, because she was a dear friend, a dear friend of, um, of my brother. Our story starts on February 27th, 1993. Some time ago, my, uh, my daughter uh, said to me, Dad, you're a, you're a cool dad. You're a cool dad. I like that. It made me feel good, you know? As parents, we, we, we like that. We, we probably prefer to be considered by our kids as the cool, the cool parents, not the, uh, the dorky parents or the mean parents or the restrictive ones. She called me cool dad. I like that. That night on February 27th, 1993, there was a father that took uh, his son and three of his friends out to a restaurant in Houston, Texas. Late that evening, sitting at the bar, buying drinks for his 18-year-old son and his 18-year-old kids, trying to be a cool dad. Just a few harmless drinks. A couple hours later, it's uh, 2 o'clock in the morning, closing time. They... Uh, they leave the restaurant, go out to the parking lot, and three of the boys get into a car, including a young man named Mark Weir. He was the driver. One cool dad, a, a bartender that looked the other way, and a group of invincible 18-year-old guys. Too drunk to know that they were too drunk to drive. Mark Weir that night made a choice, didn't he? Just a few miles away, another man named Mark, my brother, was just getting off of work. He just left work and just got into his car to drive home for the evening, a mile and a half or so from his house. Mark was an amazing guy. He was funny, great sense of humor, full of life, loved to dance, loved music. Mark was a big uh, uh, Grateful Dead fan. This section knows what I'm talking about here. <laughs> kind of a a hippie band from the 70s. He was a big Grateful Dead fan. He was a big dreamer. He, uh, he always dreamed of opening uh, a restaurant uh, called Terrapin Station after a Grateful Dead album called Terrapin Station. Mark was a writer. He was a talented writer. Loved to write. He, um, he had a dream of writing a screenplay that he would later produce into a movie with his older brother, Michael, who's a filmmaker. In fact, today, Michael, who's filming today, he has an independent film company called Terrapin Pictures. It's in Mark's memory. 
I have my own company called Terrapin Solutions. It's, it's in Mark's memory. Our, our family has a cabin up in the, up in the mountains called Terrapin Lodge. It's, it's in Mark's memory. It's filled with all of his stuff. We, we love to be up there as a family. We love to, to be surrounded by his things and reminded of his stories. We love to laugh together and spend time together up there. It's a really special thing. But you know, we would give it all back just to have Mark back. The, the accident investigator would later estimate that Mark Weir's car was traveling over 80 miles an hour when it hit my brother broadside on his driver door. Two thirty that morning in California, my phone rings, wakes up my wife and I. That's never a good call to get, is it? It's my mom. Andrew Mark has been in a horrible car accident. He um, he's in surgery right now, and you need to get over to the house so our family can be together. So we rush to the house and our family gathers to pray together and to cry together and to hold each other and to wait. And then the phone rings again. And it's a doctor in Houston, Texas. Ma'am, I'm so sorry. We tried everything we could, but his injuries were too severe. You know, the, the grief in the house that night, that early that Sunday morning, it was, it was palpable. It was um, heart-wrenching, uncontrollable, nightmarish. Mark had three brothers, um, Michael being the oldest, then there was Mark, and then there was Daniel, and then me, and a sister that's 13 years younger than me. I remember later that morning, Michael had li was living in Southern California at the time and had to fly home to meet, to, to be with, with us. And, and I remember my dad and Daniel and myself going to the airport to meet Michael. And this was back when you could be right at the gate when he was coming off the jetway. And, and here came Michael, my, my big brother. And I'll never forget it, him collapsing into the arms of my dad saying, Daddy, he's gone. He's gone, Daddy. Later that same day, our whole family would fly to Houston. I remember so much about that trip to Houston. I remember seeing the car, the car in the wrecking yard and how um, unrecognizable it was, all mangled. I remember the funeral home. Having to go to the funeral home and pick out a, a casket and flowers and make choices and decisions and logistics, it felt so cold and impersonal. Remember as a family cleaning out his apartment, having to go through all of his things. Remember that being a time where we told stories and laughed together about Mark, but we also cried a lot. I, I also remember there was a lot of anger, a lot of anger. Probably more than anything, though, I remember Sarah. Sarah was Mark's five-year-old daughter. Sarah had a precious relationship with her daddy, precious relationship. But what struck me about Sarah on that trip to Houston Sarah didn't cry. She had very little emotions. She was five years old. How, how could she possibly understand that she had lost her daddy forever? I remember the funeral. And I remember a, a dear friend of Mark's 
sitting at the corner, the morning of the funeral, sitting at the corner of South Shepherd and Westheimer. And he made a tie-dye flag at that corner where Mark had been killed. A band, Mark's favorite band in Houston called High Tailors, played at Mark's funeral, played a Bob Dylan song called I Shall Be Released. I'll never forget that. And at the graveside, the coffin was draped in this tie-dye flag. And Michael and I would fold up that flag and present it to my mom. We got home just a few days later. My, my boss was annoyed that I had taken off so much time from work. Can you imagine that? It made me angry. I, how could he be so insensitive? But I later realized how could he really understand what I was going through? See, life has to go on. It goes on, it's never the same, but it goes on. The tragic thing about this is that this story is not just our story. That same day that we got a phone call, so did another family. Ma'am, your son has been involved in a car accident. He's got minor injuries, but you need to come to the hospital. Alice Weir and her husband would go to the hospital early that morning, and the police would meet him there. Mr. and Mrs. Weir, your, your husband's going to be okay. In fact, you can take him home, but you need to know something. He was the driver, and he had been drinking, and in fact, he tested at it over twice the legal limit. There's a young man that's in surgery right now, and they're not sure if he's going to make it through the night. If he doesn't survive, we'll be in touch with you because Mark will be arrested. He'll be arrested and tried for vehicular manslaughter. Later that same afternoon, while watching TV, Mark Weir would see a news report come on, and the reporter would say that this morning, a 26-year-old man was killed in a car accident at the corner of South Shepherd and Westheimer. And Mark Weir screamed and cried, knowing instinctively that his life would never be the same. He was arrested, convicted. He spent three months in jail, three years on probation. He'd go on later to finish college. But get this, he could never get a job because nobody would ever hire a felon. Mark Weir's life would never, ever be the same. Some years later, um, my mom and Mark Weir's mom would develop a friendship. Imagine that. See, we, we believe in a, in a God that, that forgives and loves and heals brokenness. We, we don't understand them all the time. We don't understand why these things happen, but we choose to place our faith in Him, and that gives us peace. Peace that's really impossible to comprehend. Two mothers really became friends that day because they shared a tragic bond. Mark Weir's mom would later tell us embarrassingly that her and her husband were grateful that Mark and his friends didn't do drugs. A few harmless drinks were no big deal. At least they weren't druggies. Are you that naive? Am I, am I that naive? Am I that different than Mark Weir? For those that thought it was cool to shout out about 420, are you that naive? 
Huh. I've been asked, was it hard to forgive Mark Weir? Yeah, really hard. But I think of the grace that's been extended to me, and I ask, how could I not extend that same grace to Mark? Life goes on. But two families were never, never the same. Two years ago, Sarah got married. Big church, lots of people, stunning white dress, marrying into an amazing family, a young man named Matt Broussard, great family. In that day, I walked Sarah down the aisle. And, and on my left arm was, was Sarah, and on my right arm was a neatly folded tie-dye shirt. And I walked her down the aisle, and I, um, I gave her away. And then I, I turned, and I took this shirt, and I draped it over an empty chair where my brother Mark would have been sitting. Mark should have been there. Mark should have been there. I was taken from him. I was taken from her. Who, who do you blame this on? Do you, do you blame it on a, a naive parent? A dad trying to be cool? A stupid bartender? A dumb choice made in the moment by an invincible 18-year-old boy? Who do you blame this on? I hope, I hope my story never becomes your story. But I wonder, I wonder if something had gone differently at some point in your life, if some decision you made last week or last month, if something had gone differently, what role would you have played in this story? Did, did I hear that tomorrow is prom? Tomorrow's prom. How, how's that story going to play out for you? What role will you play in that story? I want you to imagine for a moment how this story changes with just a few more characters. A, a friend who says no. A dad who says no. A bartender who says no. I want to leave you with this message. I want story changers. I want story changers. Don't just avoid the story, but change the story. There, there's, a, there's an old classic movie called Network where a character in the movie yells out, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Can you get angry about a story like this? It calls for leadership. It calls for courage. It calls you to take a stand. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Not me. Not my house. Not my car. Not my family. Not my friends. Not me. Not my future. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to be a story changer. I want story changers. I want to ask you to do something. You saw an amazing thing yesterday. An un unbelievable video. Tomorrow, many, many of you will go to prom. What story will you write tomorrow night? I want to ask you, in front of everyone here, are you willing to be a story changer? Are you willing to stand where you're at and in that simple act, in front of all your friends and in front of teachers and, and family and people you know and love and people you've never met before, are you willing to stand where you're at right now 
And in that simple act, say, I will be a story changer. I'm going to change my story. Will you? Who are you? Who are you? No one.